What's good, y'all? This boy Ross back at again with another video. So we're gonna check out 10 craziest places wrestling matches have ever taken place. Now, I don't know what's going on in some of these companies or what be going through their creative process, but sometimes they just be having matches in the most weirdest places. I think one of the weirdest ones I've seen was there was a match in the ocean. Guys, I think uh, it was on the it may have been on the main page we reacted to it on the main page or maybe the rogue page one of the two but there was a match on the beach in the ocean can't make it up maybe it will be in this uh particular video man but i appreciate all the love and support you guys have shown on the channel and i am still your undisputed youtube wrestling champ of the world let's get right into this and see where some of these matches were held sucks arenas they're boring they all look the same totally unbefitting of the ridiculous nature of pro wrestling and that goes double for wrestling rings they're so restrictive it literally puts wrestling in a box but huh. some people in promotions have fought to challenge this idea by holding yeah. their wrestling in more unique locations. And these unique locations are much more in line with the expressly wacky world of wrestling. And thus I am officially petitioning to hold every episode of Raw, SmackDown, and Dynamite in a fucking cave. I'm Tempest Halen from Parts Fun Known. <laughs> and these funny. are the 10 craziest places wrestling matches have ever taken place. But before we get on with our list, make sure of course that you like this video, subscribe and enable notifications to always on so you never miss a fun list just like it. And make sure that you check out all of our end of year content coming throughout the month of December. We got end of year lists galore so make sure you don't miss a single one. Ring that bell. Ring it. Ding, 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 ding. Number 10, Kenny Omega's Family Cottage. Who would have thought the legendary career of Kenny Omega would be kickstarted in 2008 by a match in his very own family cottage in Manitoba, Canada? Omega's opponent, Mike Angels, who had much of his success in Manitoba-based company Premier Championship Wrestling, was minding his own, playing some Super Mario World when Omega and a referee would turn up and demand a match for Angels 24-7 Championship. Thankfully, Angels had his gear on underneath his dressing gown and he was good to go and the two began scrapping around the kitchen and backyard area. Amazingly, we would see some aspects of Omega's trademark arsenal in their early form throughout the bout, with his signature senton to the outside being executed from the porch to the garden, as well as the fight wow. continuing to move to a lakeside area in which Omega would perform another signature move with a hard-hitting snapdragon before performing a hadoken to Angels into the lake. Angels would emerge from the water, Jason Vor- That hadoken move, I just- <laughs> I ain't gonna lie to you, it makes me cringe. It just, it just does, bro. He style and lock in an ankle lock before gradually moving the battle to its concluding location, a giant sand hill. After a back what? and forth war atop the hill, Omega would hit a low blow and a devastating Michinoku driver that sent Angels down the hill for the three count. The contest would reportedly catch the eye of DDT Pro Wrestling in Japan and would lead to Omega getting his first of many matches with future golden lover Koto Ibushi. Amazing to think Omega's Japanese conquest started in his own family living wow. room. Number Number nine, That's very a river interesting, slash campground. Speaking of DDT, it's perhaps no surprise that Omega's match caught the Japanese promotion's eye, given they too had a penchant for the wild and wacky in their wrestling. While there have been extremely odd matches from the promotion, Ibushi versus a blow-up doll anyone, yeah, the focus for this one. entry comes entirely from the backdrop that would be better suited for a Boy Scouts trip than a pro wrestling match, a campsite. The campsite multi-man matches became a yearly tradition for the promotion and it provided numerous memeable moments, perhaps none as memorable as the time Ibushi and the man with the extremely oozy mask himself, El Generico, wow. were duking it out in a six-way contest in 2012. The match is most known for two things. One, Generico using a small child as a weapon, and of course, the Whoa. infamous kayak battle on a riverbed with Ibushi. Watching Ibushi and Generico trade shots while the referee attempted to push their kayaks downstream <laughs> was just priceless, and it should never be forgotten. Number what eight, a hell? cave. Japanese indie promotion Ryukyu <laughs> Dragon Pro Wrestling made history on March 21st, 2013, when they hosted the first wrestling event in an actual cave. No, not a Whoa. cage, you didn't hear me wrong. A literal cave. The cave in question was the Gangala Valley Cave in Okinawa and hosted a three match card headlined by a tag team match involving Ryukyu Dragon's founder, Gurukin Mask. However, due to the obvious restrictions, they can only host a small crowd for the show. But yeah. why did they do all this exactly? Well, we're not quite sure. The promotion was supposedly just experimenting, so maybe they thought this whole cave thing would catch on. I mean, it earned them an entry on Parts Fun Known, which is what all wrestling promotions secretly I mean, strive yeah. for. While it did gain the promotion a lot of notoriety and placement in the wrestling Bro, history books, it's not- They literally set up a ring in a fucking cave. 
That's wild. <laughs> Not hard to understand why it was never repeated. Despite this, it's undeniable that it looks freaking awesome aesthetically. Your oh, new Comic Con. Look, Number seven. Pretty cool on a boat. The Jericho Cruise, a perfect amalgamation of three of humanity's favorite things pro wrestling, rock and roll, I and did, uh, boats. hear about this. Known officially as the Rock and Wrestling Rager at Sea, the cruise was birthed in 2018 from a partnership between Jericho and Ring of Honor and took place over the course of four days with four different match cards for each night. As well as hosting traditional wrestling events, the cruise also hosted rock concerts as well as live podcasts and even stand-up comedy. Sea of Honor, as the first installment was called, saw 31 matches in total with talent wow. sailing from Miami, Florida all the way to the Bahamas and was such a success it spawned two more installments in 2020 and 2021 wow. with a fourth plan for 2023. Modes of transport don't often equate to a successful venue for pro wrestling, as we will find out later. However, That's the concept of though. nautical grappling is undoubtedly a success, with the latter two installments of the cruise seeing many of its matches air on AEW Dynamite. The concept clearly has sea legs and begs the question why Not WWE didn't utilize a similar venue for their pair of pirate-themed WrestleManias in 2020 and 2021. I mean, I, I know why they didn't do it in 2020, but 2021, there's no excuse. Number six, a moving train. In 2015, okay. a whole three years prior to Jeff- I have seen uh, some uh, parody wrestling matches on a, a New York subway, so I have seen that, but an actual official match on a train? This I gotta see. Because Oceanic Escapade, Japanese promotion Michinoku Pro Wrestling, would host a special 10 men, actually nine men and one woman, battle royal what? on a moving train. And yes, you did hear that right. Similarly to the Royal Rumble, two competitors would begin the match with new entrants entering intermittently while the train traveled along the Flower Nagai line wow. in Yamagata. The goal of the match was to be the last one standing by the time the train reached its destination, with elimination only occurring through pinfall and submission, and thankfully not through forceful ejection of said train like a yeah. traditional battle royal. It's important to know that as well as the competitors, the train was also packed to the gums with spectators who were thankfully there to see the action unfold and not just innocent bystanders on their morning what commute. The, the match began with Kisa Numajiro and the great Sasuke who politely took their seats among the other passengers before Sasuke inexplicably began wailing on Numajiro with chops. The action throughout is understandably limited due to the very tight spatial restrictions of the train with strikes, headlocks, and other thing, holds bro. making up much of the action. However, the tight space didn't oh, stop them from damn. including folding chairs in the match, although they were barely able to swing them. The match eventually ended in a draw between Kyoko Inoue and Fujita Hayato as they both survived the journey, and what a ride it was. The full match is on YouTube and is 100% worth a watch. Truly surreal and hilarious. That is only insane. in Japan, eh? Number five, a moving truck. Okay, maybe it's not just in Japan, as WCW was oh, also- I was just about to say this. Uh, I, I did know that uh, there was a uh, a match in a, in a truck bed in WCW. I remember checking out a video about that. No stranger to ridiculous stipulation in locales for its matches, particularly towards the end of its lifespan under the Vince Russo regime. However, years prior at Uncensored 95, Dustin Rhodes and the Blacktop Bully, <laughs> better known as Smash or Repo Man in the WWF, competed in a King of the Road match. King. What is a King of the Road match, King you may ask? Well, match. both Rhodes and Bully would be locked in a hay bale filled cage on the back of a moving 18-wheeler truck, with the objective to sound a horn that is suspended at the top of the cage. A winning concept if I have ever heard one. The match's <laughs> action was primarily displayed through cameras on the back in front of the truck, as well as the WCW helicopter flying high in the sky. The whole thing is a wow. bit of a mess in all honesty. The constant camera cuts combined with the action consisting of not much more than stumbling around. Bully eventually got the W. However, the match would not only be remembered for its ridiculous stipulation, but also for the fact that it ended up getting both men fired from WCW altogether. Both wow. Bully and Rhodes bladed during the match. And at that time, that was strictly forbidden in WCW. And oh. Resulted in both men being given their marching orders. If only a promotion had a match on a moving plane, we could get the wrestling spin off of planes, trains, and automobiles I've always wanted. Really? Number four, <laughs> a train station. Okay, so we've already covered a match oh. on a train, but how about a match at a train station? I know, uh, I want to say it was Triple H and The Undertaker. They had a match, I believe, in like a subway station. If I'm, if I'm, if my memory serves me uh, correct, I did watch a video where there was a match and uh, uh, I believe uh, Triple H was in he, on the receiving end on a tombstone pile driver right next to some escalators. So I don't know if the, if this is the match they're going to talk about. That's surely less strange, right? The difference with this entry being that the venue was not implemented for some kind of special stipulation, but instead was simply due to WWE having yep. little other options for a venue. WWE's Shotgun Saturday Night was initially hosted at nightclubs or even cafes across America, which gave it a very unique, much grittier aesthetic than the typical WWE 
product of the time. However, this was yep. extremely short-lived before WWE decided to scrap the whole thing in favor of traditional venues only six weeks into the show's run. The Damn. final traditional episode of Shotgun Saturday Night came on February 8th, 1997, and hailed from none other than Penn Station in New York City. However, with the station obviously being a public venue, this meant that WWE couldn't make a single dime from ticket sales. While the Damn. original Shotgun Saturday Night was a logistical nightmare, at least the Penn Station episode provided a memorable contest between eventual long-term rivals Triple H and The Undertaker, with a one-of-a-kind spot that saw Helmsley get tombstone <laughs> onto it. a friggin' escalator of all things, while onlookers prayed that Trips wouldn't get his luscious hair sucked into the mechanisms. Number three, <laughs> the Mall of America. Speaking of escalators, you know what else usually has them? Shopping malls, am yeah. I right? Okay, that was a terrible segue, but for entry number three, we have WCW reappearing with their historic first edition of WCW Monday Nitro from September 11th, 1995 that came from the Mall of America in Minneapolis, Damn. Minnesota. While other notable WCW events occurred in unconventional locations, such as Bash at the Beach 1995, which hailed from an actual beach in Huntington Beach, California, and of course the Road Wild pay-per-view, which was hosted for four consecutive years from the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally. However, while both of those are extremely out there, the pilot episode of Nitro has become iconic and is Damn. well remembered for the shock debut of Lex Luger, officially beginning the Monday Night War with WWE's flagship show, Monday Night Raw. The sold out crowd on hand for Nitro's inception saw heavyweights such as Sting, Ric Flair, and Hulk Hogan all compete in the hour long show. And while future editions would move to traditional venues across the country, WCW certainly started with a unique opener. That is for damn sure. So they started in a mall. Their uh their uh Monday Night Nitro started in uh the Mall of America. That's pretty cool. Did not know that. Did not know that. Number at all. two in an empty baseball stadium. Some fans may associate AEW. the empty arena match with WWF's halftime heat or AEW Stadium Stampede, and rightfully uh -huh. so. They were both pretty awesome. However, for this entry, we would like to focus once again on the cinematic wrestling legends over at DDT Pro Wrestling and their June 1st, 2017 bout between Minoru Suzuki and company they president Senshiro Takagi the at the very stadium. empty Tokyo Dome. What sets DDT's effort apart from the rest is once again its sheer randomness and sense of humor, with Suzuki in particular just providing countless memorable moments. Cameos from Japanese legends Jinichiro Tenru and Asha Kong, who even sings the Japanese national anthem to begin the match, by the way, as well as other comedic appearances from notable Japanese pros like Ken Oka, Saki Akai, and deathmatch legend Jun Kasai, who switched professions to become a janitor for one night only. The highlight, what? though, has to be Suzuki brutally kicking the pestering Gota Ihashi down three Damn. separate flights of stairs. Honestly, the sound of those kicks. Good grief even oh for a comedy God. match suzuki never holds back the match was eventually won by suzuki with a gotch pile driver at home base of the field after <laughs> suzuki managed to break a submission hold by crawling to second base I mean, he was safe, what can I say? Afterwards of which, Takagi would announce his retirement only to swerve Suzuki and give him a stone cold stunner. So yeah, <laughs> if you haven't figured it out by now, DDT hell? are just the best. And what number one hell? on a desert island. And finally, the number one spot fittingly goes to another Japanese match coming from the premier promotion of the country, New Japan Pro Wrestling. While not often as outlandish as DDT, New Japan has perhaps the wildest location of any wrestling match ever, that being a remote, Desert Island. Oh, what? And not only is it a match on a desert island, it's a death match on a remote desert oh, island. No. Providing the earliest example on our list and perhaps the first example of a cinematic match in wrestling, the match served as the blow off of the personal feud between Masa Saito and New Japan Pro Wrestling founder Antonio Inoki. The pair had already duked it out in the ring numerous times that year, with the veteran Inoki primarily getting the better of the younger Saito. However, even after numerous in ring clashes, the only fitting thing to do was to take the action as far away from a wrestling ring as humanly possible to finish the feud. Psych, just kidding. There was a ring on the <laughs> island as well. The match took place at Ganryujima Island all the way back on October 4th, 1987, with a ring set up at the location in dramatic fashion. Despite the inclusion of said ring, both men would spend the majority of the match outside of it, battling all over the island for a whopping 125 minutes, Damn. becoming one of the longest matches in wrestling history to this day. Inoki would once again triumph over Saido in the end via a TKO, closing the book on their rivalry once and for all, and I mean, I bloody well hope so anyway, how can you top a match on a desert island? Given the excessive length and truly plodding pacing throughout the match, it's not very watchable these days. However, for historical significance and sheer spectacle, you will That's... struggle to find an earlier or better example of a promotion deciding an arena just wasn't enough. And that's our list. Make They're sure, of course, that you like this. ending a feud on a damn island. He said, you know what? This feud is too personal. Let's take this to a remote island and we finish this shit. <laughs> wow. That's, that's actually pretty insane. 
over 100 minutes too sheesh that's some that's some some bad blood right there man but comment down below let me know which one of these uh uh these uh places surprised you the most um for me the whole mall of america i didn't know that's how uh the first episode of uh monday night nitro was in mall of america did not know that so that was a pretty interesting tidbit man but hey i appreciate all the love and support and i am still the undisputed youtube wrestling champ of the world appreciate y'all kicking in with me see y'all next one peace